Hi there, it's Alexandra from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and this is a Q&A covering some of your questions about gardening and also about the Middle Sized Garden. We'll be covering planting, trees, soil and also some questions about me as a gardener. I'll put links to any resources we mention in the description below and if you're new here the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. I haven't been able to answer all your questions, but I have tried to answer a few on the community post as well. And apologies if I don't get the names pronounced right, it's sometimes a bit difficult to tell on YouTube. But let's start with trees. Penny Wilkendorf has two acres in Texas and water is really at a premium and she'd like to plant more trees, but she does wonder if this will use up too much water. Definitely go for planting the trees, Penny. The important thing is to plant trees that will do well where you are, in other words, native trees, because those won't use as much water and they will grow well. You will have to use water in the first couple of years after they're planted to help them get established. So there is some extra water use. However, trees absorb pollution, they improve air quality, they support wildlife, and in this last very harsh, dry summer we had in the UK, it was really noticeable what parts of the garden were partially sheltered by trees and what were just complete in open sunlight. Any part of the garden that had, say, four or five hours of tree shade was just so much better, much greener, the plants survived better, the flowers were better than the full sun areas. So, in fact, in the end, the tree's shade will stop water evaporating from your soil. Trees are a fabulous thing. Go for it. Vera Wallace says that her neighbour's tree roots all the way along a fence are making it difficult for her to plant there and what should she do? I think one of the easiest things to do is possibly to have raised beds because it, then you can import the soil and the tree roots won't come into it. It's also worth looking at the canopy of the trees, look up at how far is the shade extending over your garden because actually that also affects it. But if you move just a little bit away from the tree roots and a little bit away from the canopy so that you're sort of on the edge of where the tree canopy is, then often you can plant quite a lot there. So it may just be a question of accepting that you can't plant too close to those tree roots, uh, but you can plant a little bit further out, make the border a bit deeper. I've got a row of trees along the side of my garden and in fact quite a lot grows there. If you do have raised beds or gabions, they mustn't touch the tree trunk because the tree trunk needs to be exposed to the air, so then make sure that there's a gap between the tree trunk and whatever you've built. Nick Chancellor asks if it's a bad idea to plant trees close together. And of course, the first thing I thought was, well, what's close together? Because in jungles and forests, they grow close together quite naturally. And I've got quite a lot of trees in my garden that do seem to me to be quite close together. So I went out and measured the distance between them. And pretty much always, it was about 180 centimetres about five foot and they do look close and where a tree or a sapling has self-seeded sometimes it is closer than that but then it's chosen to be there and often it's just very near its parent tree. I sometimes think if we plant closer it will perhaps not want to get established. Toga One has got a tree planted somewhere where the soil is very wet, it's too wet for it, and it's a mature tree which he's planted fairly recently. And he says, should he try and change the soil, or is it better to move the tree? And if so, is it better to move the tree immediately, or to leave it there for a while? It's definitely better to move the tree. It's so much easier to actually plant plants that want to grow in a particular condition than it is to change soil. People talk about adding gravel and doing all sorts of things to improve your soil and you can improve your soil but you can't change it and you don't want to just spend your whole time trying to make your soil different from what it is. And in terms of when to move the tree, don't move it in the height of summer or in the depths of winter. Spring and autumn are the best time but having said that, the sooner the better. That takes us on to soil. Stone Wallflower says, what's the difference between compost and mulch? And compost is a mulch, but there are lots of other mulches that aren't just compost. Compost is broken down, well-rotted uh, garden matter or perhaps scraps from our kitchen, and it's fantastically good and nutritious to lay it on the soil. Anything you lay on the soil will help retain the moisture. So you could have a gravel mulch and that would help stop water evaporating in a dry garden. Or you can use well-rotted manure or bark chippings. So they're not all compost. 
anything that rots down will also improve your soil. Stone Wallflower also said that she planted some plants last autumn and they've been very disappointing this summer. And has she done something wrong? And this ties in with another comment I got from someone who said she felt really depressed about her garden. She'd done everything that she'd been told to do and it looked sad and straggly and she just felt she wasn't a very good gardener. And the important thing to remember is that we've had a really tough summer. I don't know how tough it's been where you are, but I know from your comments that a lot of you have had a summer that's unusually hot and dry or unusually wet. And plants often do badly in a bad summer. It's not your fault. And the other thing is that it can take some plants a few years to get going. So there are plants where you can just plant them in the garden, they look great, but quite a lot of plants, for instance, my Acanthus mollis rue Ludan, I planted it in 2011. It really wasn't looking really good until 2014, but certainly the first year for many plants won't be the best. Stetifier and Suzanne Imgarten both asked how you could garden in clay soil, uh, particularly if it's very wet, and how you can change it, and whether you have to put lots of gravel into it. And once again, I would say, don't change your soil, plant the plants in there that really enjoy those conditions. And there are millions of plants around the world, so there will be some good ones. It always helps the structure of your soil to put a layer of compost on top of it or well-rotted manure. That'll feed the soil and it will improve its structure so it will drain a bit better. But in the end, you've got what you've got. We need to work with it. Brian Carr asks about alternatives to peat-based composts. Now this is quite a problem because some of the alternatives to peat-based compost use choir, which is a coconut derivative, uses a lot of water in its manufacture and has to be transported a long distance. So there are no easy answers, although there are also products made from sheep's wool and bracken and other things. We have got very used to using peat in the UK as part of a planting medium and part of the whole issue is actually getting used to not using it. I haven't used a peat based compost here for about eight years and I don't really notice any different in my gardening. And some people have reported that some formulations don't work as well as others. However, it's also worth remembering that there are other factors that can cause, say, your seeds to fail or your plants to fail, uh, such as the climate, the weather, a bad collection of seeds, another pest, another disease. So it's not always the non-peat based compost that's going to be a problem. Peat mining is hugely environmentally destructive and there are countries like Australia where they have a very good horticultural industry and they've never used peat. So there really is no justification for using peat in gardening. But equally, there are no simple answers as to the best alternative. Planting. Kay Lindsay says, what are your three best anchor plants? Which is a great question. Anchor plants are the plants that you can plan your other planting around. They're very often evergreen shrubs because evergreen shrubs are there the whole year round and they'll give you something to look at in winter and in summer. I think that my favourite anchor plant has to be silver birch. I just think it makes a wonderful presence both as a backdrop to flowering and in a border and in a garden and especially in winter. And I'd say that my second best anchor plant would be any kind of multi-stemmed tree, particularly one that's kept quite low. And for my third one, I really thought about it, and there are lots of wonderful plants, but I thought it was interesting to look at how yuccas can work as anchor plants, particularly in things like rock gardens. Tom Lodwick and Freya A both asked about planting distances and ways of planting and saying, you know, they're talking about planting threes. Does that mean three groups of three plants around a border or is it just three plants together or three plants individually? Most plants, when they're sold, will have an ideal spacing put on the label. And if you can follow that, that is quite a good idea. I'm always cramming plants in to spaces and they sometimes come out looking sort of, oh, gulp, you know, and they don't grow as well. Tom Brown, who's a well-known gardening journalist and head gardener at West Dean Gardens, plants in fives and sevens and nines, and he makes a sort of tadpole shape. So you've got a clump of plants together with one or two just sort of on the outside. And he says that makes, it, makes them weave through a border much better. Generally, the idea is that you should repeat things through a border. Uh, you absolutely don't have to. In the end, this is your garden and do it the way you like. But all the gardeners, Tom Brown included, say that actually to have fewer different kinds of plants and more of each plant really works well in a border. Silence Do Good asks about planting shrubs along a drive. She wants quite a formal, elegant look. 
and she wants to know if it should all be the same kind of shrub or whether she needs to use different ones. And of course, once again, it is your garden, so it is very much what you like. But I have seen formal hedging used quite well and clipped and using one or two different kinds of shrubs, like these hedges here, which is cypress and thuja. And they, they're just slightly different. The advantage to using some different shrubs, not having everything the same, is that if you get a pest and disease and you've got a long row of plants and they're all the same, it's very easy for it to spread. So it is healthier to have some mix of shrubs. Anna Schiegel loves prairie planting and wonders if she could do a prairie border down the middle of her long thin garden with lawn on either side. And yes, of course, it would be, it would be lovely. And once again, it is your garden. So if that's what you most want to see, absolutely go for it. However, you may actually enjoy the planting more if you have one much bigger border to one side of the garden and then the lawn down the side. Or you can do what Posy Gentles does. It's not prairie planting, but it could be adapted to prairie planting, which is that she has big borders across her long, narrow garden. So you come out, there's a terrace, and then there's a really big border and just a path through it. And then it opens up into a small lawn and then there's another really big border. And you can get lots of plants in this way. And of course, you can see them really well from the house. And it gives you great depth and great colour because lines down the middle of a long, thin garden will tend to make it look longer and thinner. Richard Heigel and Monologue, who actually Monologue has her own YouTube channel around her cottage garden in Somerset, by the way, asked how I got started in gardening and if there's any advice I wish I'd known when I started that I'd like to pass on. The first time I remember thinking about gardening was when I was about three or four and my father suggested that I took an apple pip and planted it in the garden. Actually, it did come up the following summer, and so I was very excited by that. But we used to move a lot, so I don't know what happened to it after that. He was in the Foreign Office and in the Army, and sometimes we had the occasional big garden because he had a country posting, but most of the time we were in towns and cities, so I always longed for a garden. And then I got here to this garden, and I suddenly discovered when I moved in that, of course, a house stays exactly how you want it to be until you change it. A garden grows and within weeks I realised I was completely out of control and I had no idea what was going on. Fortunately I had a friend who worked for the RHS called Will Den who said just weed and mulch so obviously you need to get someone to help you identify what the weeds are. If you do the first year of just weeding and mulching, mulching, adding a layer of garden compost or well-rotted manure on top of your soil, you'll, both you'll be doing your garden good, you'll be keeping it under control and you'll be getting to know it. And then of course I got books and I went to workshops and lectures and watched programmes and I am a journalist. I wouldn't call myself a gardener, I would call myself a journalist and I used to work for Good Housekeeping and for Harper's and Queen and I've written for The Times and The Telegraph and it is very much in my nature to write about all my experiences and at the time I'm also a novelist and I had a book published called Sisters-in-Law by Little Brown and they suggested I start blogging in order to publicise Sisters-in-Law. And then I decided I needed to find out more about blogging. So I researched it and there is very good online courses run by someone called John Morrow. And I started the Middle Sized Garden blog and it became quite successful. And then people said, oh, well, you must be in video. So I didn't feel comfortable in front of the camera. I'm very, very poor technically. I didn't know how to film. I didn't know how to edit and I do do all the filming and the editing myself with my husband uh, who's only joined in the last couple of years since he retired. So it was a very steep learning curve and my older videos are really terrible and but I did find very helpful YouTube Creator Academy which is a collection of videos that tells you how to make videos. With the Middle Size Garden blog and with my own garden and with the YouTube channel, it's been incredibly important to me that I talk to people who are gardening now. Because in gardening, as in many things, advice gets passed on and things get done just because they've always been done that way, without anyone actually thinking about whether there are better ways to do it, easier ways to do it. And so the people who are working in gardens now, who are the real experts and have the most fantastic amount of knowledge, they're the ones I talk to, to ask them questions about the little section of their area, may it be dahlias or roses or garden design, that I can apply to my middle-sized garden and which I hope will help you too. 
My latest novel is The Night Lawyer, which is co-written under the name Alex Churchill. And meanwhile, the YouTube channel, I think, has become my great passion. And I do really find all your comments very inspiring and very informative. And I really do take what you say on board. I've learned a huge amount about gardening around the world, for example. So do carry on letting me know what you think in the comments. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.